Welcome to the Land Geek Podcast, your resource for information and tips to making money by buying and selling land. Let the Land Geek show you how to make a passive income by working smart, not working hard. Learn strategies and tricks to make money buying and selling raw land today. And here is the man that's going to help you do that, the Land Geek. Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, the Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www. TheLandGeek.com, and today I'm really excited because I've got a guy who has been around the block. He's probably forgotten more about real estate than I even know. So today's guest is Larry Muck, the president of Springboard Capital Resources. He's most recognized as the chairman of the American Association of Private Lenders. He has a 30-year career in banking and is the host of the very popular Community Investor Podcast. Larry Muck, I am pleased and honored that you are spending your valuable time to uh, educate the Land Geek listeners about yourself and your background and your career. Larry, how are you? Uh, You know, uh, I'm doing so well that people are starting to get suspicious of me, Mark. (laughs) <laughs> um, you know, what are you on? Who knows? But yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to be on your show. And uh, as you and I have talked, um, you know, it, in my world, we don't talk a lot about land, but you are all about land. And I am, that, that's why I'm happy to be here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I'm just thrilled that you're here. But before we get into land, like, let's talk about you and, and how you became. Larry Muck, president of Springboard Capital Resources, and and you know one of the biggest hitters in, in private lending. Well, I don't know if I'm one of the biggest hitters. I'm certainly uh, <laughs> I probably know more private lenders than almost anybody else in the country. But you know, I, I started out uh, um, out of grad school and I went straight into banking. Um, I wanted to get into the lending business and. You know, um, ended up in a smaller community bank and a regional bank holding company and uh, spent quite a bit of my time there. They they called me back for a couple of years to be in HR, um, charge of management recruiting, training, um, worked in the Kansas City uh, main bank for a few years in the lending business and then started out in community banking. And that really became my passion. Um, uh, to um, work with, uh, you know, our bank it, back in the day when, it, as a community banker, we used to say that we made the loans that made sense. Sure. You know, sure. It, we didn't always, um, on paper, they, they weren't all pretty, uh, but they generally worked. Right, right. So what, what's the cliche about, about banking? Um, they're like a, an umbrella when it's sunny, uh, yeah, is that well, is that what it is? Uh, you Something know, like that, right? That that is a new one on me. Uh, but I will tell you that one of the greatest things I ever heard in banking is that bankers are not generally liked, but in uh, but they're uh, most often trusted. Right. You know. So. Um, right. <laughs> I never, you know, in a community bank setting, when you're one of the most well-known people in that bank or in that town of about 125,000 people in the trade area, um, you don't know whether anybody really is your friend or not. It was really kind of sad, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, you don't know whether people are attached to you because you're attached to uh, access to money. Um, but anyway, that that was... Uh, Something I struggled with from time to time. Sure, sure. I mean, I, I look. I'll kiss up to my banker uh, <laughs> as as much as I can. You know, take him to lunch, whatever he needs. You know, you want you want sports tickets. Let's get it. Um, you know, they're they're again, they're they're just good people to have in your corner. Yeah, and, exactly. but but it's like you said though, because you do have that trust factor as well. Um, right. You know, these are well educated people, and they look at. A variety of, of deals, and so you know it's good to have that sounding board when you're looking at an investment to be able to go to a trusted banker and say, "Well, what do you think?" Even if they wouldn't lend on it, is that right. is that something that you th- you think is 
you know, that's pretty valuable. Or, or well, I think that people should have, um, frankly, I think that people should know uh, real bankers, people that have been in the business that, you know, um, were taught the basics and and have had an experience that has taken them through a number of different industries. I, you know, uh, I guess I'm saying that uh, a banker that I would choose to associate with should have a very broad background so that they can, um, so that they're able to understand what it is that you're trying to accomplish from multiple perspectives and not from some blinders on uh, narrow vision. Sure, sure. I, I'm really up on on um, people creating a relationship like that. But there's less and less of those bankers left anymore. Yeah, let's talk about that. So the death of the community bank, why why has that happened and what are going to be the consequences of that? Well, um, you've seen a consolidation in the banking industry uh, over the past uh, many years, 20, 25 years, and really when interstate branching was authorized in 1994, uh, you saw uh, the banking industry begin to merge into larger and larger uh, pools. Um, what that did over time was to uh, create a system where instead of having community bankers, a lot of decisions were being made outside of the market in which um, the bankers operated. And they essentially um, were turned into geldings, if you know what I mean. Sure. And, um, <clears throat> you know, really didn't have, uh, you lost that ability for somebody that really understood the community to be in a, a position of uh, decision-making authority. And not to pick on the big banks, but if you look at U.S. Bank, Bank of America, you know, the, the top seven banks across the country that own most of the deposits, they, they just really don't have, uh, particularly at the small end, they don't have uh, much uh, local decision-making authority. When I left banking back in 2009, you know, um, we'd gone through a situation where really the authority was essentially pulled out of the local markets because um, things were so bad at that point in time that they just really didn't want people making loans. And that's that's really what drove me out of banking is when I couldn't, um, when, when I couldn't continue to do deals that made sense um, and to serve the community, then, you know, I really... Uh, it just uh, the reason for me being there was no longer there. So, sure. so I left. So you left, and I, then you transitioned into private lending, correct? Well, I transitioned into poverty. Uh, <laughs> you know, but you know, I tried a couple of different things, um, and uh, if I'd known you, I'd been okay. Uh, that's all I can say. Yeah, I, I would. I would have taught you how to start flipping land. Yeah, exactly. Probably not in Kansas City, though. Yeah, probably not. But, but yeah. you know, the uh, – uh, but the uh, – back in uh, – back in the day, you know, I just really uh, um, was trying to figure out what to do. And I ended up going and, and working with one of my former clients that I had believed in very strongly and and uh, he owns an insurance company that only insures – uh, residential investment property nationally in and um, he'll do liability insurance all day on vacant land so you need to put that back in your thinking cap but yeah yeah uh, um, but the uh, uh, he decided he wanted to expand into some different areas and so the American Association of private lenders was around and um, we had been a vendor supporter of those and it was operated by four guys that sort of did it in their spare time and out of their back pockets. And and we went in and said, you know, you guys need to pick this up. I mean, this space is exploding. They said, well, if, if you think you can do better, then just go ahead. So so we did. And they looked around the office. They said, well, has anybody here ever made a loan? Oh, Larry, you've only made about a billion of them. Right. Um, why don't you run this association? So all of a sudden I was in the association management business. And... Um, you know, uh, a year or so ago, we brought in a new ED and executive director, and 
it was really time for me to consider to do doing some other things. Uh, and although I remain chairman of the association, I'm not really involved on an active basis on a on a, uh, on a day to day um, schedule. So um, we started uh, Springboard Capital Resources, and the whole point of that business is to be able to bring uh, capital together with deals, um, to be able to uh, find deals for private lenders to fund and to be able to refer those out and to really build a, a, a strong practice in underwriting, preparing executive summaries, and uh, finding funding uh, for uh, projects across the country. Okay, so just so I understand this correctly, I, let's say that I'm, I've got a project and I need, you know, $18 million, right? Uh-huh. And there's, I don't know, let's say the loan to value on it is 40%, right? I'm in. Okay, you're in. And yeah. now the, now uh, the, the traditional, the big bank, won't lend on it. And why won't they lend on that deal? Well, you know, regulatory environment has become so strict with banks now that um, in a deal like that, if the, if the ultimate repayment source is the liquidation of the collateral, right. uh, you know, if there's not cash flow, uh, those are much more difficult for banks to be involved in than, than they used to be. You know, $18 million is a, a pretty fair-sized project, and within the private lending world, um, there there are people that can do projects that size. Uh, but what I've seen is that lenders in general have had to walk away from some projects because they were just over their head. Sure, sure. In terms of total dollar amount. And so uh, one of the things that I'm building right now is a platform to be able to share those deals among trusted uh, parties, trusted lenders that understand the underwriting practices of the people that uh, they're doing business with. And so you could take an $18 million loan and you could spit, split that up into four or five different pieces and um, and not, uh, not overly weight a portfolio with one particular asset. Banks did that all the time. And with correspondent banking and with participations. And so, you know, um, that's what I'm working on building right now. Oh, I've got a great contact uh, for you when, when we get off the podcast. Um, cool. Yeah. So that's really interesting. So you're kind of like the guy that knows the guy in a way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's funny you say that um, because there's a, a young lady that if I walked up a, to her today, she'd go, she'd look at me, she goes, I know a guy. <laughs> and I'd say, I know the guy that knows that guy. Right. And she's the, she's a daughter of a former um, pro football player that's, uh, my brother's married to his sister. And so, anyway, a long story. Sure, sure. But, so let's, let's kind of circle it back into land. Um, okay, let's say, for example, I'm in North Dakota, and things are exploding up there. And you know the counties can't even keep keep up, right? There's just right. there's just too much going on up there. And would you loan on say a mobile home park that I might be able to to lock up? You know, if I can lock up the land for let's say three to five million dollars, is that something that you would lend on, or does you know it's just you're gonna no, I, I can't. You know, even though you might say the land value is seven million, I'm not. I'm not going to touch it. You know, uh, there are uh, people that I've met that like lending in North Dakota, and, and um, of course, with oil prices going down now, it's kind of hard to. Um, you know, who knows what's going to happen? But yeah. uh, surely the the oil shale is here to stay. Anyway. Uh, I digress, but uh, mobile home parks are, um, from a private lending perspective, uh, I do know lenders that will do mobile home parks. Okay. Um, That would be a little bit, um, uh, that would be on 
the riskier side of things for people because you know mobile home parks if if they're not tied down to the foundation um, it, there's people just, it, anyway yeah yeah, yeah it's it's, I, de- it's definitely riskier right yeah yeah they could so, all, they could all they could all leave tomorrow and then go to a park down the street that's got lower rents right and so yeah. the you know it's not a, as easy as that but you know the uh, but uh, the point is that uh, the private lending business is a niche business, as, as you have expressed with respect to land. And um, right now we're in the process of compiling um, a, this group of lenders and really doing a deep dive and understanding what it is that they're looking for so that when a project does come across our desk, instead of wasting everybody's time, um, we will be able to broker that out to uh, the appropriate lenders that, that really uh, want to see those types of things right now will you uh, do residential and commercial or just commercial oh no what you know the private lending industry itself it was really focused uh, principally on uh, single family residences uh, one to four family um, there is some mixed use money out there okay uh, and you know but uh, you, you know that's that's where the explosion in private lending has come from is because of the mortgage meltdown and the amount of inventory that's been available. I mean, is you know, that's been the greatest thing about, um, the great opportunity is, has come around because the, um, the, the inventory has been out there for, uh, people to make a lot of money on by going and fixing and flipping, rehabbing, you know, uh, things are much tighter now than they were, but there's still good opportunities out there. Um, I personally believe that private lenders um, have to uh, be willing to diversify and to be able to go with the market. And um, those that do will find uh, plenty of opportunity. And those that just decide to stay in their their little niche, um, you know, that niche may not be there for them uh, in another year or two. Who knows? Right. right. So, so based on your experience and all the deals that you've funded and looked at. What what are some of your favorite niches? Well, and, and five I, years it, from now, what do you think it's going to be? You know, the fix and flip market uh, is is still a good one, um, but you know, a lot of people are getting in more or less um, because rents are so high. Uh, there's a lot of money that's going into the into the rehab and hold market. So you've seen a lot of turnkey providers that are bringing investor money in, and particularly. Um, IRA or self-directed IRA money uh, is going into that. I, you know, uh, Eddie Speed is a good friend of mine, and Eddie's in the performing and non-performing notes space, and and he's of the opinion um, that we've got great legs on this market in terms of being able to buy notes and and um, uh, make those work. Uh, I I think there's a, a a better than even chance that we're going to see additional problems in the uh, residential space or it's going to continue to be opportunities there because of the maturity of a bunch of the oh well the hamp loans you know that where they restructured um, the uh, uh, amortization of the financial arrangements with the the homeowners and a lot of those are beginning to mature uh, those workout periods and so you know it's uh, it's easy to see uh, that there's probably going to be more opportunities in single family, although it seems to um, th- it seems to be quite a bit of competition in there right now. Sure, sure, yeah, there, yeah. I mean, has there ever been a time where it wasn't competitive? Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, you know, uh, I, I, you know, back in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, two thousand ten, there was so much inventory out there that it. Uh, you know, everybody that could swing a hammer was getting into the business, and, and that's uh, so. Anyway, that uh, that's changed a little bit, but I, I will tell you, just um, it, the biggest opportunity I see over the next uh, five years is probably in the small balance commercial market. Uh, what does that you know, mean, this, small balance commercial? You know, small balance commercial being uh, anywhere from uh, two fifty to up to a a couple of million bucks and above, and those would be uh, loans on, say, strip centers or uh, owner-occupied 
office buildings, you know, office buildings in general in selected markets. But the, the reason why I bring that up is because there's so much of that debt that's maturing over the next a uh, few years, like $1.7 trillion, and, and the capacity to soak all that up isn't there because the um, um, the performance of those units is less than what banking standards really require to get traditional financing. Sure. Now. So, in, in you know, some of those may be, um, you know, uh, cash flowing at a 1.2 times uh, debt service coverage ratio, um, you know, and really the standards are higher than that now, 1.4, 1.5. So um, there will be opportunities for private lenders to step in, refinance some of those properties. There's probably going to be continue to be some haircuts taken by the uh, traditional lenders. There, You know, sure, we you may be able to pick up debt for cheap. What do you think of this deal? Let's say I buy a tract of land and it's zoned commercial, right? And I put up a self-storage unit. But I need $1.2 million to build it. Is that something that would that would that I could go to private lending for? Or would it sure. have to be – I'd have to figure out a different way. I'd have to buy an existing one. You know, uh, there are um, – again, there's a lot of niche lenders out there. And there's money out there for self-storage units. Uh, but, you know, particularly um, – there was a time when – when self storage, um, it, these things all go through cycles. Sure, you know, and you're going to find markets where self storage is overbuilt. Um, right, but you're going to find markets where it's still a viable uh, alternative. I just worked with a a woman. I won't say what state it's in, um, but uh, there was a guy that was just going to sell. He had a bunch of uh, vacant land. He was just going to sell it. And, you know, just was wanting to get out of it. And she convinced him to um, uh, come up with a business model that would allow him to um, store construction equipment and uh, give people, you know, give contractors a place to be able to store their equipment, you know, equipment yards. Sure. Um, that would be a portion of it. But then the other side of it was that um, U-Haul franchises were available to be put on those. And so uh, it, it, it's just a home run uh, yeah. for the people involved. So I think that as long as you keep your imagination, you know, as long as you're creative and you're, and you're not stuck in a paradigm that doesn't, doesn't allow you to try new things or to think, what, you know, what is the highest and best use of this land, um, I, I think there's still a lot of wins to be had out there. Yeah, absolutely. I, I like to say I'm flexible like a yogi and uh, and just opportunistic because right. you've got to, you've got to look at deals and you've got to be creative and you you can't uh, you can't, you know, just have, you know, blinders on. So Right. That's right. Yeah. So, um, that's interesting. I just had uh, someone come to my door with bringing me sweets. Oh, you know, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, that's, right that's, after Thanksgiving, and you probably had a whole uh, bunch of pie, right? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't consider it a good Thanksgiving if I can if I can actually put my pants on. Like, you, you know what I mean? Like, that button needs a pop. You know, my wife needs to make a derogatory comment about my gut. Like, that's a good Thanksgiving to me. You know, uh, I wish I could say differently, but that's true. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm with you on that one. Yeah, you know, this year though, I went to Disneyland, uh, thinking for real. No, for real. I thought, oh, you know, this is brilliant. I'm so brilliant. I'm going to go to Disneyland during Thanksgiving, and everyone's going to be eating, you know, at, at their table with their families, and they're watching football, and they're doing all those fun Thanksgiving things, and we're going to have the whole park to ourselves. I couldn't have been more wrong, Larry. You like, know, I. I, I've been around the parks a little bit in my life, but I, I don't. Uh, unfortunately, for example, if you go to Orlando, or, Orlando's maybe one of the sweatiest places on earth. Yeah. You know, um, so Disney World, I just, it doesn't hold it. Never held any real attraction to me. And then, you know, if you're going to go to Disneyland, yeah, 
it's a pretty busy place out there. <laughs> it's it's crazy. It's crazy. I used a a software program to optimize my day. So you know we would be zigging when everybody else is zagging, right? And I thought, but oh, everybody this... else has bought that program, right? And every they must have because you know, like we analyzed it. It was like four hundred minutes of of being in line and a hundred minutes of riding on the rides. But it, you know, at least having the program, I didn't have to have the conversation with my kids. What are we doing next? I'm like, this is what right. we're doing next. So that you know, yeah. it was it was worth the money for that. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, you know, and I, I I've been to Disneyland. I've been to uh, Disney World, and you know, I think everybody ought to go once. Oh yeah, yeah. once. Like, but yeah, once. Make sure you're in shape. <laughs> That's all I can say. Yeah, yeah, definitely make sure you're you're in shape and you have good shoes. Yeah, exactly. For sure, and so and lots it, of patience. Do you buy? Do, do you find a lot of land opportunities in in uh, California? Is the state too pricey? No, I, I mean, there's certain counties I really like in California. Kern County, San Bernardino County. Um, you can find good deals there, for sure. Um, yeah, but if you're going to go into L.A. County, it's, or, you know, Southern California, it's going to be very, very tough. Yeah. But, um, you know, it, it, just, it really just depends on your capital, right? So if you, if you can find a, the right deal, I mean, I, I'd have no problem buying oceanfront property. If the person was distressed, and I knew I could I could flip it seventy eighty cents, uh, you know, retail to someone else real quickly on the other end of it. I'll but tell you, those deals can I tell you a quick story? Do you have time for a quick story? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm part of this private lender network. It's called Impact Wealth Wealth Classes. George Anton, you you know him. I know him. Yeah, he's been on the uh, on the podcast. Wait, no, he was on the podcast. Uh, I take that back. I'll have him on the podcast. But I have talked to him. Yeah, we did a – Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good guy. Um, and uh, I was talking to some of his uh, people that were part of his community, and they were trying, trying to put together a deal that I thought was kind of crazy. Um, they were going to put uh, like a, a $1.7 million second on a property in Beverly Hills that had a $3.8 million – uh, first on it, and so they're basically guaranteeing the front end of that. It's a total scrape and uh, rebuild, and so um, they were out raising money in the community, and they did get the deal done. They actually got it done in six days, which was kind of amazing. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, I had to put a, a few people together, but then um, come to find out, you know, they were going to build this house. It was going to the total cost was going to be about. Uh, nine or ten million, and they were going to sell it for seventeen million, and they were all going to make a, a pretty good slice of cheese. And uh, before they ever got the plans even finished, the scope of the project went up. They made the loan. The scope of the project went up. It got to the point where it was going to be a twenty-five million dollar uh, sales price on the house, and and so you know um, they're having to scramble around to figure out how to get all the construction funding together. But a developer came to them and and offered them. You know, seven million dollars to to uh, take over the project, and that would have meant they would have had about a million and a half in profit to split among themselves. But um, they said no, and they the guy said came no. back. And, wow! Yeah, yeah, they said no. The guy came back the next day and offered a mate, and they said sold. Wow! Yeah. Is that not amazing? That's a great deal. Yeah. Yeah. But but if you if you swing for the fences, you know, you're going to strike out more often than not. And you know what I like about your business is the fact that what you teach people is to, you know, uh, the, you, as you said earlier, the tortoise and the hare, um, you know, you slow and steady wins the race, uh, you know. Oh, yeah. We're um, not, yeah, we, we, yeah, exactly. I mean, our niche, we don't swing for the fences. Uh, I'm nothing against doing it, but that's not what I teach. I mean, you know. Singles and doubles, even though we're making huge margins, you know, three hundred to a thousand percent, but we're not, we're not, you know, putting in, we're not doing million dollar deals. I mean, we're talking about, you know, five to ten thousand dollar pieces of land, which probably you you would think, oh my gosh, you can buy land that cheaply in this country, absolutely all day long. It's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, I in 
I'd be all over that, particularly if you're really good at infill housing, and, you know. Yeah. But there's people out there looking for lots to build on. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, Well, Larry, we're at that point in the podcast where I get to put you on the spot. I hope there are beads of sweat coming down your forehead when I ask you. It's hot in my office. Uh, no, I know it is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what is your tip of the week? <laughs> well, and my it's like, best it's like tip an is, actionable tip. To yeah, help well, you know, but the first thing that, as you know, the first thing that comes to my head is don't take candy from strangers. Right. Um, but, <laughs> you know, um, I, in my years in banking, I turned 60 in August, so, you know, I've been around a little bit, as you mentioned. Um, but I've always found that you know the the risk return relationship is is pretty um, pretty consistent. There is no such thing as free lunch. Right. Now, it, the re- kind of returns that you're making are pretty extraordinary, and um, and the reason why you're able to do that is because you're in a marketplace that is probably a little bit underserved. You're you know you, 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 you the big money, it's too small for the big money to get in, and a lot of other people really don't understand how to do it. And so, you know, uh, my best advice is to have a system, you know, make a plan and work the plan, right. you know, and, and don't deviate. Don't, I'm a shiny object guy, you know, so don't, don't be looking at all the shiny objects around and saying, you know, maybe I ought to try this over here. If you're good at what you do, then just stick with it. Yeah, I, I love that advice. That's great. Well, my tip of the week is going to be to go to LarryMuck.com and InvestSCR.com. Um, and also check out uh, Larry's radio show on Community Investor. Where, where can we learn more about you, Larry? Are those the two best places? Yeah, you know, I've got a pretty good LinkedIn profile, and I always encourage people to link up with me. Um, the My LarryMuck.com, I, I caused a lot of consternation around here when I picked my own name, but, you know, I just decided to engage in the auction battle, and, and really, you know, I won it for a whole 10 bucks. Nice. You know, but, uh, you know, it's just as easy for people, if they want to reach out to me, they can email me at Larry at LarryMuck.com. My, my website um, it's not what one would call robust, where it's, it's under construction. But what I would encourage people to do is that if they have questions or they want to know um, uh, some things that are going on, uh, you, you know, if they want to, if, if they want to um, meet up with me, then just email me, um, and we'll be making the the website more robust. But the community investor. Um, the, you know, uh, this radio, my radio show is a, a subset of Community Investor Magazine, and um, there is a website for that, um, community, communityinvestor.com or communityinvestormedia.com, and um, there you can find more about our enterprise and what we're doing. Fantastic, fantastic. All right, well, Larry, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your very busy schedule to... Uh, to talk to uh, myself and the Lane Geek community, um, because this is an area that, you know, private lending we we don't hear a whole lot about, especially in my niche. So I definitely think it's always valuable to, like you said, you know, expand your horizons. And, right. Um, yeah. Well, I think that you and I, there's a lot of things that we can do um, to help your listeners uh, together. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you very much. And I want to remind everybody, uh, go to www.thelandgeek.com and you can download for free the Passive Income Blueprint. Get the ebook, How to Avoid the Three Feet of Land Buying Mistakes. And of course, always get this informative and engaging podcast delivered each week to your email inbox. And if you're interested in some wholesale land, go to FrontierPropertiesUSA.com and please give us some love. Uh, Leave us a rating on iTunes. I'd really appreciate it. And we'll see everybody next week. Thanks, Larry. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Land Geek. Join us next time for more tips, secrets, and information that will help you succeed. Stay connected with The Land Geek on Facebook at facebook.com slash thelandgeek.